A warm welcome to everybody tonight for our astrophotography session and we're here with Alan Wallace. This meeting will be recorded so that we can minute it and it may be broadcasted later on. If you are not happy with this, you'd probably best leave the meeting now. I'm Danny, welcome. I'm the Dark Skies Officer for Sodonia National Park, and I work for the Dark Skies Partnership, Project North, and we work with the AONBs as well, the areas of Santic National Beauty. I work in Uncle C, Penllyn, and also the Dee Valley and the Cluidian Range, and I work to reduce the light pollution so that we can all enjoy the stars. So thank you very much, Alan Wallace, for being here tonight. He's extremely busy. I'm a huge fan of his photography and I've been a fan of his for a long, long time. So I'm really happy that he's able to join us tonight. I'm going to pass over to Alan now. Thanks, Alan. Thank you, Danny. It's the awesome work. We get to go. Yeah, you, yeah. Get, you get to go. Oh, maybe actually, just a note, but if you have any questions whilst we're going along, if you put them in the chat, um, I will wait till the end and then we'll we'll have a bit of a question and answer session with Alan and I will ask the questions for you so we don't have to uh, all be talking over each other. Thank you. Thanks, Alan. Thank you very much, Danny, and everyone at Prostec NOS for putting this evening together and thank you all for for coming and giving me your time today. Uh, so it's gonna be a bit of a presentation about astrophotography for, for beginners, a bit of a discussion about myself and my work, the different areas of Wales, uh, where you can enjoy some nice dark skies, free of light pollution. Uh, and then we'll talk about the, the camera gear and, and the settings that you would use and some good tips to, to get you started and get acquainted with astrophotography. Uh, so for those of you who don't know me, my name is Alan Wallace and I am now a full-time landscape astrophotographer. I started photographing the night sky back in 2015 and three years later in 2018, I left my job as a design engineer, mechanical design engineer, uh, to go full-time with my, my passion, which is photographing the night sky um, and you can find me on social media with that uh, tag at the top right hand corner there and I think a large part of what's enabled me to be full-time as a freelancer um, comes from my YouTube channel so you can find me on YouTube Alan Wallace uh, luckily I don't share my name spelling with many people so you should be able to find me quite easily and there are plenty of videos there you can watch after today's talk for extra tips and uh, just videos of my adventures around Wales and around the world photographing the night sky and all of the amazing things that you can find in the night sky but for me I started out in the Brecon Beacons I live in Pontypridd in South Wales so it's only a 30 minute drive for me to the Brecon Beacons and the, the Brecon Beacons is a dark sky reserve so it's internationally recognized by the international dark sky association and there's measures in place to cut down on unnecessary light pollution uh, and to protect the night sky so at any given opportunity i'd be up in the brecon beacons under the stars capturing the images of, of the wonderful landscape and of course the dark skies so this is the view from Penavan, the tallest peak in the Brecon Beacons, looking down towards Cribbin and just a beautiful clear sky full of stars. And the skies there are even dark enough to see and photograph the Milky Way. So again, just another image looking south up towards Penavan, Corn D on the right and Cribbin again on the left hand side. So really lucky to live so close to dark skies and would you believe it I've even seen the northern lights from the Brecon beacons on a number of occasions but this night in particular was very good back in March 2016 a very strong display of the the northern lights 
I'm also very lucky to live close to the Gala coast, so I'm sort of halfway between the mountains of the Brecon Beacons and the, the South Wales coast. So we have the Glamorgan Heritage Coast and the Gower Coast, which has beautiful south-facing views because towards the south is nothing but open sea, so there's no light pollution towards the south. Um, so that's what makes the, the south coast really, really good. So you get this really nice dark view when you're facing south. So this image here, you can see the, the core of the Milky Way, the galaxy which we call home. And on the left, the two brighter stars are actually planets that was Saturn and Jupiter. And you can see even the light of the planets reflecting on the river there, just on the bottom left-hand corner. And it was on the Gower coast where I first saw the bioluminescent plankton, very much up there with the northern lights on uh, the list of the most magical things I've ever seen. And it's something that's normally associated with sort of tropical areas, but to, um, to have bioluminescent plankton in Wales uh, is truly incredible. And I've seen it quite a few times now, and it's not just limited to the South Wales coast. It's been seen uh, in West Wales and it's also been seen in North Wales with Penmon on Anglesey being a very popular spot to catch the bioluminescent plankton. It can be seen any time of year, but it tends to show up more uh, during the summer months when we have beautiful clear skies and warm days. Uh, it seems to bring it to the shore. And I, I never tire of seeing the bioluminescent plankton. It's really, really incredible. I then started traveling further from home to see if I could find some darker skies, perhaps some even more beautiful landscapes and we have the Elan Valley Dark Sky Park uh, in Mid Wales, the world's only privately owned Dark Sky Park, I believe. Um, a little bit darker than the Brecon Beacons being in Mid Wales. It's not surrounded by uh, the big towns and cities that we have in South Wales, like Cardiff and Merthyr Tydfil and Abergavenny. Um, so the skies there uh, tend to be quite a lot darker, as you can see in this image here a nice stretch of the winter Milky Way arching across the sky in this big panoramic image that I captured. And you'll also see a sort of triangular diffuse glow of light emanating from the horizon. Uh, that's actually something called the zodiacal light, which is dust that's within the same plane as the planets, catching the light of the sun and scattering the light of the sun back towards Earth and illuminate in the night sky. Uh, it, it's best seen in spring sunsets and autumn sunrises. So this time of year is actually perfect to catch the zodiacal light. Uh, you'll see it in the morning, in the pre-dawn hours, uh, facing west. But you want to make sure there's not much light pollution in your west, uh, and also no moon in the sky, because it's a very faint glow, so it needs to be nice and dark to see it. But you can very much see it with the naked eye as well. It, it's also known as the false dawn, as it, it feels as if dawn has begun, but it hasn't quite yet begun. So if you're out after sunset on a clear day with no moon uh, in the next month or so, see if you can spot the, uh, the zodiacal light. But of course, if you want the most epic shots, you can't beat the Snowdonian National Park, which is also a dark sky reserve, similar to the Brecon Beacons. Uh, so this image that I captured here on the Snowdon horseshoe, I was on Ushluith. Uh, you can see Snowdon on the left-hand side of the image, the Milky Way arching across the sky. And if you squint your eyes a little bit and you look towards the little peak on the right-hand side, you'll notice me standing on top of the mountain as well. So I left my camera there, uh, taking continuous photos and then I ran into the scene to grab a, a self-portrait up on the, the Snowdon Horseshoe. And you can even see the stars reflecting in the glacial lake down below. So you can imagine uh, just how calm it was that night. And it was easily one of the, the most amazing nights I've had in Wales. And this was a photo I took a couple of hours later. Sitting above the clouds, I think I was one of the only people in Wales that day who could who could see the stars because the, the country was covered 
in this cloud inversion, something locals like to call the dragon's breath. And before the pre-dawn hours, we watched the moon rise above the clouds and sitting up on the mountain peaks was, it just felt like such a privilege and it was a really, really incredible sight. Uh, and you can see the Milky Way in the top right corner, obviously not shining quite as brightly as it would uh, because the light of the moon is, is starting to illuminate the sky. And then of course, near the National Park, uh, we have Anglesey, very beautiful island, um, and just incredible dark skies. So you have the pilot's cottages on Anglesey and the winter night skies. You might be able to recognize the Orion constellation in the very middle. For those of you who might be a little bit familiar with the stars and the, the brightest star on the left hand side is Sirius, which is the, the brightest star in the entire night sky. But it just goes to show that wherever you are in Wales, you're really never too far away from skies that are dark enough to see the Milky Way. And you can see this image here, the United Kingdom uh, captured from the International Space Station by Andre Kuipers, one of the European Space Agency's astronauts. Uh, you can see the northern lights in the distance on the left-hand side. But if you just look at the light pollution around the UK, you can see just how lucky we are in Wales. So much of Wales is very rural and dark. And again, we have these dark sky reserves and parks and dark sky sites in the Cambrian mountains. Um, so we're doing a lot to protect the night sky. And it's, it's certainly not something we should take for granted. And personally, I think it's something we should be very, very proud of. So what do we need to do this kind of photography? We're going to talk about the gear uh, and the background image you see there. Uh, if you don't know if you recognize the cantilever stone on the summit of Glidavach in Snowdonia in the Ogwen Valley and me pointing out the, the Orion constellation again. It's my favorite constellation uh, and very visible at this time of year as well. If you have clear skies in the next months, uh, you'll be able to see Orion in the west after sunset. You're going to need a camera, whether that's a DSLR or a mirrorless camera, it doesn't really matter. Um, but you ideally want a camera that has interchangeable lenses so you can swap the lenses on front of the camera uh, because the lens will give you a big advantage uh, for capturing these images. So you ideally want an interchangeable lens camera, whether that's a DSLR or a mirrorless, again, it doesn't make a big difference. Uh, and then you want a wide angle lens. So what, with a wide angle lens, um, you have a wide scene so you can capture the landscape as well as a lot of the night sky. And there's a little parenthesis there saying preferably f2.8 or wider. So f2.8 refers to the aperture of the lens. And if that doesn't make sense now, we'll, we'll talk about it in a little bit more detail shortly. Uh, you're going to need a tripod because each photograph will take 15 to 30 seconds. Uh, so your camera needs to be absolutely still. Um, as for recommendations, it's a bit difficult. I'm sponsored by a tripod company, so it's impossible for me not to be biased. Um, but I would advise starting out with a pretty good tripod because of all your gear, a tripod is, if you have a good tripod that you look after, it will last for years and years and years and years. So instead of buying uh, multiple cheap tripods and incrementally upgrading, it's it's worth investing in a, a decent tripod, uh, perhaps carbon fiber to keep it nice and lightweight because they will just last and last and last rather than having a cheap tripod that's gonna fall apart and wobble and uh, cause you a headache. And then the fourth essential item is a head torch. Obviously you wanna see where you're going, um, but the head torch allows you to keep both of your hands free so that you can operate your camera and your lens uh, and just work a lot more comfortably. And again, there's some brackets there with uh, a red light option. So you will often see astronomers using red light. Um, the main reason for this is to protect your biological night vision. So when you're out in the dark, uh, 
it takes your eyes about 20 to 30 minutes to adapt to the dark. So you can see a little bit better in the dark. You can see a lot better detail in the Milky Way and the landscape. But if you have a bright head torch or you look at a bright phone screen or the, the screen on your camera is very bright, your pupils will instantly contract and you lose that biological night vision and uh, you can't quite see. Um, now, with the cameras, uh, cameras are sort of split into categories based on the size of the sensor. So you have full frame cameras, which are often considered professional cameras, let's say, uh, which have the biggest sensors. Uh, and then you have crop cameras, AP, APS-C crop cameras. They have a slightly smaller sensor. It's normally a 1.5 or a 1.6 times difference. And then you also have micro four thirds cameras, which have a smaller sensor again. And then obviously things like smartphones have an even smaller sensor, uh, which are not very good in low light. You really want the biggest sensor you can get um, for good low light photography. So most astrophotographers, especially wide angle astrophotographers, will use full frame cameras. So you've got that big sensor and it, it performs really well in low light. But that's not to say that you can't take images with crop sensor cameras and micro four third cameras, you definitely can. Um, but if you think you're gonna get a little bit serious about this, you ideally want a, a full frame camera. But there's one little asterisk note there and that's that um, sort of a modern APS-C crop camera that was released you know, in the past year or two uh, is going to be better than a full frame camera that's eight or nine or 10 years old. Um, so typically full frame cameras are, are better uh, but if there's a big age difference there, the modern APS-C cameras are a lot better these days than they were sort of five or 10 years ago. And when I was talking about a wide angle lens, you'll see lenses with a millimeter rating on them. And that millimeter refers to how wide the field of view is. Um, so you'll notice in the bottom left corner there, a 14 millimeter lens has a very wide field of view. Um, but if I was to use a 50 millimeter lens, you'd have a much tighter crop. It's a bit more zoomed in. Um, so if you're starting out as a beginner, you want to start with wide angle lenses. They're a lot easier to work with as a beginner. So 14 mil, 18 mil, 24 mil. Sometimes you have zoom lenses like 14 to 24 mil or 16 to 35 mil is very popular. Um, or you get fixed, uh, fixed focal length lenses, or they're also known as prime lenses where you can't zoom, they're only one focal length. Um, but the millimeter rating of, of a lens is basically how wide the field of view is. And I always recommend to beginners to start nice and wide. And uh, I often get asked what is my recommendation for the best bang for buck setup. And I would always recommend a, a second hand Canon 60 um, and then a brand of lens called Samyang. So Samyang lenses are manual focus only. There's no autofocus, but in astrophotography, you never use autofocus. You always do manual focus. So because these lenses are quite manual and they don't have autofocus, they are relatively affordable and they perform quite well for astrophotography. So again, going back to what I was talking about with the tripod, um, the Canon 60 second hand is about 400 to 500 pound, I think. Um, but if you buy a cheap camera, you may find yourself in a year or so wanting to upgrade and then you end up compounding that investment. So if you really want to get good bang for buck and you want a camera that's going to last you, you know, a few years that you're not going to outgrow, I, I'd highly recommend the a second hand Canon 60. And that's the original 60, because there's now a version two, there's a Mark II, um, which doesn't have better low light performance. It's pretty similar to the older version. So in terms of astrophotography, the original Canon 60 is a very popular camera. It's the camera I used for a lot of my portfolio, but I recently switched to Sony for other reasons. Um, but I know quite a lot of professional full-time astrophotographers who still use the 60 and absolutely swear by the 60. And then <coughs> with the Samyang lenses, there's a few 
there's quite a few options out there, but I always recommend the older manual lenses. There's a few new Samyang lenses with autofocus, um, but you don't really need that and it's going to cost you extra money. So I think one of the most popular lenses in wide angle astrophotography is the Samyang 14 millimeter f 2.8. Uh, because it performs really well for astrophotography and it's it's one of the most affordable lenses out there. Um, and it's probably one of the best for beginners. The 24 millimeter lens is, is amazing and it will be a good complementary lens to the 14 millimeter. Or if you're struggling to decide, you can get the one in the middle, so the 20 millimeter, which is still nice and wide, still great for beginners and uh, provides a, a good middle ground uh, in that sort of wide angle category. And before we take our gear out, this is where I get a little bit patronizing and I start sounding like my own mother, but I'm going to tell you all to keep warm uh, because the thing with astrophotography is that you are always out on the coldest nights of the year. Uh, the reason for this is that typically you want nice cloud free skies. You want the stars to be out. You want no clouds in the sky. Uh, but when there's no clouds in the sky at night, temperatures drop very, very quickly. So you're always out on the coldest nights of the year. Uh, when it comes to clothing, I always have merino wool base layers. Uh, it's, a, it's a wool from a, a sheep in New Zealand. Uh, and it's very insulating. It allows your skin and sweat to breathe and wick away. Uh, it's just an absolutely wonderful material. As for an insulating layer, I always have a down jacket with me. Um, they have an amazing weight to warmth performance ratio. Um, so it's not heavy to carry and they, they keep you incredibly warm. Uh, and then obvious things like hats, gloves and scarves. There's also these hand warmers you can get. Uh, these ones are sadly disposable. You can get reusable ones, but the reusable ones don't last as long. Unfortunately, these disposable ones last up to about 10 hours. Um, and you can keep them in your gloves or, you know, sometimes you can put them in your end in the end of your boot if you want to keep your toes nice and warm but they're really nice to just hold on to keep your hands warm so that you can operate your camera and um, just helps you be that little bit more patient out in the cold so that you can spend more time taking beautiful photographs and then obviously a nice hot drink a flask of tea or a flask of coffee will, will certainly keep you going for an extra hour or two well, my personal favorite it's a little hip flask of whiskey because it does the job a lot quicker so now we are going to look at the camera settings the first three camera settings and the most important ones we need to consider are the settings that control the exposure so they control how bright the image is and they control how much light we collect because in astrophotography, you're typically in areas free of light pollution uh, with no moon in the sky, or perhaps there is a little bit of moon in the sky. But because it's so dark, the main idea, the main concept is to try and collect as much light as we possibly can, and that will improve the quality of your images. So the general thinking for the settings is to collect as much light as possible. First and foremost, you want to make sure you're shooting in RAW format. Um, a lot of people might be shooting in JPEG, um, may be a lot more familiar with JPEG images. RAW files are similar to JPEGs, but they have a lot more information in them. So when it comes to editing uh, later on, when you get home, you have a lot more freedom to change the colors and recover detail from the shadows and dark areas. You can still shoot in JPEG, uh, but if you want to edit your images and really sort of get the best out of them, you want to shoot in RAW. Um, but that does unfortunately mean that you need software to open the RAW files, um, software such as Photoshop or Lightroom. Um, and there are many, many alternatives out there as well. So we're first going to talk about the aperture. And the aperture is basically how wide the opening is inside the lens. So it's all about the lens. It's nothing to do with the camera itself. And it's how wide the opening is in the lens. And the aperture is denoted by something called the F number, where the smaller the F number, the wider 
the opening is inside the lens. And if you remember when I was talking about the lens earlier, I mentioned preferably a lens that opens up to at least f2.8 um, because I find f2.8 to be a nice sweet spot between uh, image quality and getting enough light for a good photograph. You can still take images with f4 lenses, um, but if you really want to get some good Milky Way detail, some good pictures of the, the northern lights, you ideally want a lens that opens up to at least f2.8. Um, and I have a lot of lenses that open up to f1.4, f1.8, and f2. And even with those lenses, I still find myself using f2.8 uh, because it helps improve your image quality a little bit. So just a note there to say f2.8 is my most used. Pretty much 80 to 90% of my images are taken at f2.8. Uh, but when I'm talking about image quality, this is just an example here. Um, of the stars in a photograph where the aperture was at f1.8 and then when I stopped the aperture down to f2.8 you'll notice in the f1.8 image the stars have little wings on them uh, this is caused by some lens aberrations known as coma or astigmatism I won't bore you with the details but lenses tend to perform better when you stop the aperture down when you increase that f number so again this is another reason why I use f2.8 because you can see with this lens in particular it, it fixes those aberrations on the stars and the stars look more round and they look more like stars uh, instead of little glowing birds in the sky. When it comes to the shutter speed again the, the concept is to try and collect as much light as possible uh, so you might say, oh, I'm going to leave my shutter open for five minutes or 10 minutes. But the problem is if you go too long with the shutter speed, your stars begin to trail. So the stars move slowly across the night sky, but it's not actually the stars that are moving. It's you that's moving. Planet Earth is constantly rotating on its axis. And it's that rotation that causes the stars, the sun, the moon, the planets to move in the night sky. So if the shutter speed is too long, Earth's rotation will cause your stars to trail. Um, but there's a, a relatively quick and easy way to find out what sort of shutter speed you should use. And it's all to do with the focal length of the lens that you're using. So as I was talking earlier, lenses have a, a millimeter rating, like 14 millimeter or 24 millimeter. Uh, if you use the 500 rule, you can find out what your shutter speed needs to be. So if you were using a 24 millimeter lens, for example, you do 500 divided by 24. And I think it comes out at about 18 seconds. So that would be um, a good shutter speed um, for you to start with. And then you can check your images to see if the stars are trailing or not and whether you need to adjust your shutter speed by a couple of seconds. But the, the 500 rule only works with full frame cameras. So the cameras that I was talking about earlier that have the bigger sensor. Uh, if you have a crop sensor camera, you can simply replace 500 for 300. So it would be the 300 rule. So for example, um, a 10 millimeter lens on a crop sensor camera would be 300 divided by 10, which comes out as 30 seconds. Uh, and if any of you have a micro four thirds camera, you can use 250 instead just to get around that uh, so this will help you get to a good starting point but of course you could just check your images when you're out in the field just make sure your stars are not trailing not looking like lines uh, and make sure you keep your stars nice and round so you want to use the longest shutter speed you can possibly use until you start seeing trailing that way you collect as much light as possible uh, because the longer you leave the shutter open the more light you collect on the sensor in that long exposure photograph. And then the third setting that controls the exposure is the ISO. The ISO is basically a, a digital gain in the brightness of an image. So the more you increase the image, the brighter the image becomes. Um, because we're working in such dark conditions, you, you do have to use high ISO values. Uh, the biggest issue that comes with using high ISO values is that you have noise in your images, digital noise. 
and this can manifest itself as chrominance noise so sort of a grainy texture and then you also get uh, color noise um, so you get blotches of red and blue particularly in the darker areas of your image um, but sadly it's just something we have to live with and have to learn to deal with in astrophotography uh, until camera sensors improve even more and even more um, but ideally I'd recommend most cameras to go to at least 1600 if you have a bit more of a modern camera perhaps a full frame camera you can certainly go up to 3200 and a lot of the time I will shoot at 6400 um, so if you if you have a Canon 60 like I mentioned earlier you can very comfortably go to 6400 or 3200 um, but if you have a bit of an older camera or a crop sensor camera or a micro four thirds camera uh, you might not want to go past 1600. But if you are shooting in RAW format, as I mentioned earlier, instead of JPEG, um, in software like Lightroom and Photoshop, you can remove some of the noise. You can help, you can deal with some of the noise in post-production. Um, so it might take you a while, but it's just about finding that ISO where, yes, you're going to have noise in your image, but you should be able to deal with it a little bit in, in post-production later on. So again, just typically 1600 to 6400. And it's worth checking your histogram in the fields. So if you're not sure what the histogram is, uh, it, it's basically a graph that shows you the amount of darks, midtones and lights in an image. So when you capture an image, Normally there's a button on your camera, which looks like an eye for information. So take an image, press play to view that image. And then when you press I, you should get a lot of information, including a histogram. And that way you can see just how dark your image is. Uh, and the reason I found this useful is that when I started out in astrophotography, um, I was taking these images and when I was looking at them on my camera, they looked absolutely amazing. There was beautiful detail in the foreground. And then when I got home and put the images on my computer, I found that the images were too dark and you couldn't see anything. And I, I very quickly realized that when you're out in the field and you're in a very dark environment, your camera screen is very, very bright relative to the environment. When you get home and view the images on your computer in the daytime, uh, you realize they're not as bright as you thought they were. So checking the histogram is a surefire way to make sure that your images are not too dark. So on the left hand side, you can see the graph is bundled up to the left edge of the graph. Um, so all of the tones in the image are dark and that's an underexposed image, it's too dark. The image in the middle is what you wanna be aiming for. That's a, a decent exposure for uh, an astro photograph so you can see now the peak of the graph has shifted up a little bit so you can see that the image is brighter um, and that would be a good aim just make sure that the graph is not crammed up against the left edge uh, of the image so that's underexposed on the left that's well exposed in the middle and then the image on the right is a, is a technique known as exposed to the right where you push the graph up as much as you can uh, without pushing the data into the right hand side. If the data does go and touch the right hand side, it becomes white and you, you lose detail. Um, but typically in astrophotography, it's quite difficult to achieve an exposed to the right histogram uh, because you're in such a dark environment and you're using the limits of your camera's settings anyway. So you want to sort of aim for that middle one there, the well exposed one. Just make sure that the 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 graph is not bunched up to the left. If your graph was bunched up to the left, like the underexposed image, I'd advise you to increase the ISO because your aperture is probably as wide as it goes at f2.8. You can't increase your shutter speed anymore because the stars will trail. So that's when you use the ISO as the, the sort of final control of your image brightness. So you can increase or decrease the ISO uh, to get yourself a well exposed image. So just a quick summary on those three, because they're the most important settings. When it comes to the aperture, um, as I mentioned, 80 to 90% of my images are f2.8. If you really want to get good shots of the Milky Way, 
you ideally need a lens that opens up to f2.8 because not all lenses open up to f2.8. Um, the shutter speed will typically be in the region of 15 to 30 seconds, depending on what lens you're using. And again, use that 500 rule to get yourself to a good starting point. And then with the ISO, you'll typically find yourself at 1600 to 6400, unless there's a lot of light pollution or moonlight where you can reduce the ISO. And again, just use the ISO as your final control of the image brightness to make sure that you've got a nicely exposed image and that it's not too dark. Now, when it comes to firing the shutter, if you actually press the shutter button on your camera to start the exposure, um, your camera will shake a little bit and you'll see that in your stars. You can see that the camera has wobbled from pressing the button on the camera. Uh, so there's a few ways you can get around this. The first one is to use a delay, uh, an in-camera delay. So all cameras should offer um, a delay to the shutter, shutter delay. I typically use a two second delay, which is usually enough time for the camera to settle down and be nice and stationary before the exposure starts. Uh, but you might want to use five seconds if your tripod's a little bit wobbly. Um, but just setting that delay just means you can press the button on your camera and your camera has a couple of seconds to stop shaking uh, before it starts taking the exposure. And then the way to do it is to use a cable shutter release. So these are quite simply a button with a cable that you can plug into your camera and then you can press that button uh, without needing to touch your camera or move your camera in any way. And um, they're normally relatively cheap and affordable. Or I will always have a wireless intervalometer with me. The one I use is a Pixel TW283, uh, which looks very similar to the one that's pictured there. <coughs> um, so there's a receiver which you plug into your camera and then this remote becomes wireless. So I can fire my shutter button from 10 meters away, 15 meters away, sometimes 100 meters away. And being an intervalometer, it has extra functionality. So I can use it to program time lapses and, and do various things. Uh, but I'll typically have an intervalometer with me. You can also plug the intervalometer directly into the camera as well. So you don't need to use it wirelessly. You can use it in the same fashion as a, a cable shutter release. Um, but I do a lot of time lapsing. So I, I'll always have an intervalometer with me so that I can program my camera to take continuous photographs, which I can later turn into a time-lapse. <laughs> As for the white balance, this is a, a, a hotly debated topic in astrophotography. A lot of astrophotographers will tell you that you have to use daylight color balance um, to get truly accurate colors. But I always find daylight to be very warm, uh, which for me doesn't bring that sense of nighttime and cold. Um, so I'll typically use a setting known as tungsten in my camera. Or if you can set the Kelvin of the white balance on your camera, uh, I typically find myself around 3,300. Uh, because for me, I just feel that sort of those cool blue tones uh, do a far better job of evoking a sense of nighttime and cold because it's always cold when you're out at night in Wales. So there's no right or wrong answer. Personally, I'll use tungsten or 3300 Kelvin to get more of a sense of nighttime. But if you're shooting in raw format, as I mentioned earlier, it really doesn't matter what white balance you use. Um, because in post-production, you can change the white balance with no detrimental effects. If you're shooting in JPEG, uh, you don't have that freedom. If you try and change the white balance of a JPEG, um, the colors sort of fall apart very quickly. But if you're shooting in RAW, uh, you can shoot in whatever white balance you want, and you can change it in your RAW editing software later on with no detrimental effects. If you're not sure about what setting to use or how to change it, you can just leave it to auto. Most cameras do a pretty good job when the white balance is left to auto. And a lot of the time, uh, my cameras are just left on 
automatic they normally do a pretty good job but if they don't i can change it in light in lightroom in post-production because i shoot in raw uh, and i have that freedom to change the white balance so that's the the symbol there for tungsten it's normally a little light bulb and again just a little note to say the automatic is also okay as for focusing, this is perhaps one of the first sort of sticky situations for beginners. Uh, when it comes to focusing, I always recommend manual focus. Most cameras autofocus will not work in the night. And the first step to focusing in is take the lens cap off. And I don't mean to be patronizing. It's something I forget to do myself even still. And I'm sort of looking at my screen thinking, why can't I see anything? Uh, and it's because I've left the lens cap on. And then you want to enter live view mode. So live view mode is where you are viewing the preview of the image on the back of the screen. So you're not looking through the optical viewfinder, the little hole on top of the camera. Um, make sure you're using live view mode so that you can preview the image on the back of the screen. Uh, and there's a little note there saying make sure your focus is already close to infinity and settings are dialed in already. Um, so focusing to infinity is basically focusing as far away as your lens can focus. Some lenses have an infinity marker on the focus ring. So you want to start with the, the focus ring with the marker on the infinity marker because that will get you to a good starting point. If your lens doesn't have uh, an infinity marker, just keep zooming until you're zoomed as far away as you can possibly zoom, uh, not zoom, sorry. Keep focusing until you're focused as far away as possible. That will give you a better chance of, of seeing a star. And just make sure your settings are dialed in. So your ISO, your aperture and your shutter speeds, make sure they are ready. And then you wanna find a bright star or maybe a planet if you're struggling to find a bright star or a planet, you can use a distant street light. Just make sure it's sort of at least 50 to 60 meters away. Or perhaps you can see a distant town on the horizon or across the sea. Uh, just find a nice bright light source. But ideally, you want to use a bright star or a planet if you can. Uh, and then you digitally zoom on that bright star or planet. So there's some, a couple of images here. Um, I think taking on a 60 of what you can kind of expect to see, which is pretty much a black screen. Um, but if you're sort of already focused close to infinity as far away as you can, your settings are dialed in and you're aiming at a bright star or a planet, you should just about see it. Um, and as you can see there, I've put the white box over the star and then you can use digital zoom on your camera. Most cameras will allow you to zoom in onto the screen to make the star a little bit bigger. And then you basically adjust the focus ring until that star is nice and sharp. So basically until that star is as small as you can possibly get it. And that's when you're focused on the star and you're ready to shoot. You can aim your camera wherever you want now. Your, your focus is set to the stars and you can move your camera around and take your photographs and just keep checking as you go in through the night that you're still in focus and everything's still okay. You haven't accidentally knocked the uh, the focus ring or anything. I do get a lot of people in my workshops who are hard of sight and they struggle to see uh, the star on the back of the screen. And what we found very useful is a jeweler's loop. So jewelers will often use a little magnifying glass um to inspect diamonds or, or whatever they're looking at uh, if you can just pick one of those up for a few quid and you can just put it on the screen um, and that will hopefully help you see the star a lot better if you're a bit hard of sight um, but keep trying the focusing is, is often quite a sticky step for beginners but once you get the hang of it you'll you'll be doing it in no time And then there's a little bonus tip there to lock down the focus ring with gaffer tape. It's not essential, um, but there's, there's been times in the past where halfway through the night, I've accidentally knocked the focus ring and then I come home to a bunch of out of focus shots and there's, there's nothing you can do to save them. So 
sometimes if I'm doing something important or if I'm doing a big panorama, I, I will take a little bit of gaffer tape uh, and just lock the focus ring down and make sure I don't accidentally knock it. When it comes to light pollution, again, we're so lucky in Wales, you're never too far away from dark skies. Um, but there's two forms of, man, of light pollution. There's man-made light pollution in street lights, car lights, industrial fires. And then there's also natural light pollution. The main one that you want to worry about is the moon. But things like the zodiacal light and lightning uh, are also technically forms of, of natural light pollution. But the main one you want to worry about is the moon. Um, you can use this website here, lightpollutionmap.info. It shows you a colored overlay on Google Maps of, of the light pollution. Uh, you can browse the entire world if you so wish. Uh, and the colors are quite intuitive. So red is obviously a bright source of light pollution. Going to yellow, green is not bad. And then blue is even better. If there's nothing, even better still. Um, but this can give you a good idea of the light pollution in your area. Um, but you also want to consider the direction you're facing as well. So as I mentioned earlier, the South Wales coast, even though it's, you know, it's quite red and yellow, when you're facing south, because there's nothing out to see, that south facing view is very dark. So you also want to consider the direction you're facing as well. So keep that in mind. It's not just about how the light pollution is on that direct point on the map. And just to give you an example of the difference light pollution can make this image here um, of the Seven Bridge taken from Chepstow, you can just about see the Orion constellation, the main stars of the Orion constellation on the upper right, uh, upper left, sorry. And then in contrast to somewhere like the Elan Valley in mid Wales, where the Orion constellation in the center of the image is just completely lost in the chaos of all the other stars that you can see when there's no light pollution in the sky. As for the moon, there are a million different places you can find the moon rise and moon set time. I like to use this little application called Phases of the Moon Pro on my Android phone because I can put a little widget on the home screen which shows the live phase of the moon. And then when I press on that moon, it comes up with the, the rise time and the set time and the constellation it's going to rise in and set in. So it's a nice, quick, easy access for me. And I think iPhones have recently started widgets as well. So they, it might be an iPhone version now. I'm not 100% sure. But yeah, there's a million different places that you can find the moon rise time and the moon set time. And again, just an example of the effect the moonlight can have. This is an image taken down Rosili uh, on the Gower coast of the moon setting. And then after the moon had set, you can see much darker skies and a lot more detail in the Milky Way. It's also useful to know about the twilight stages. A lot of people have often ask me what's the best time to photograph the night sky. Um, and quite simply, between the morning and evening twilights, uh, which are based on the position of the sun. So when the sun hits the horizon, that's when the sun is at zero degrees and that's either sunset or sunrise. When the sun dips further below the horizon, so when it's between naught degrees and minus six degrees, that's when we have something called civil dusk, which you can see on the left panel of that image in the top right corner. As the sun continues to drop below the horizon to minus 12 degrees, that's when we have nautical twilight. So a lot more stars begin to appear and the sky darkens. And then when the sun is between minus 12 degrees and minus 18 degrees, that's when we have astronomical twilight. And that's the image you can see on the right hand side there. Sky is much darker, a lot more stars visible. And that's when you'll see things like the Milky Way and the zodiacal light appearing. And then between the morning and evening twilights, we have nighttime. It doesn't get any darker. It's the same darkness all night. On average in the UK, it takes about two hours from sunset to astronomical dusk um, to full darkness, but that changes massively depending on the season. So in summertime, we don't actually have a nighttime. We have two months of perpetual twilight. Um, but if you want to find out what the, tw the times of the various stages of twilight are, timeanddate.com uh, is a very good free resource 
to find out what time the twilights happen uh, and then you can plan your shooting accordingly as for the movement of the stars as i mentioned earlier the stars move because of earth's rotation so here in the northern hemisphere when you face north all of the stars turn anti-clockwise circles around a, a dot in the night sky known as the north celestial pole and we can easily find the north celestial pole because polaris the north star is very very close to the north celestial pole so polaris the north star is always found perfectly north above the horizon and it doesn't really move it's it, you can't notice to the naked eye but polaris doesn't move and all of the other stars turn anti-clockwise circles around polaris so these constellations are known as circumpolar constellations they are always in the night sky all year round just turning circles around polaris um, so in the northern hemisphere we have ursa major the big bear the big dipper Ursa Minor, the Little Bay or the Little Dipper, and Cassiopeia. Uh, these are some of the most obvious of the circumpolar constellations. You can see them all year round. And to find Polaris, all you have to do is find the Big Dipper. I'm sure all of you can recognize the Big Dipper. And when you follow the last two stars, Merak and Dupe, they point to Polaris, the North Star. If you're facing east, as Earth rotates eastward, objects appear to rise in the east and then they set in the west. Um, so this is a star trail image. Uh, I think it's about five hours. You can see how the stars move when you're facing east. So the stars, the planets, the moon, they all rise in the east and cross the southern skies. So the moon and the planets are all on the same plane. They're all on the, this same plane called the ecliptic plane. And for that reason, they all follow the same path across the night sky. And this path is known as the ecliptic. Um, so the moon, the sun, the planets, they all rise in the east. They cross the southern skies and set in the west. And they all follow this imaginary line known as the ecliptic. And you can see this motion in the stars as well. So this star trail facing south you can see how the stars rise in the east and then arch across the southern skies and head into the west and the constellations we see in the south depends on the time of year so there are winter constellations spring constellations summer constellations um, that you'll find crossing the southern skies so as the year goes on the constellations in the south are constantly changing if you're not very familiar with the night sky and you want to try and make sense of what you're looking at and learn a few constellations whilst you're out, in the, out and about, um, I highly recommend Stellarium. It's basically a night sky emulator, so it shows you what's in the night sky um, for your current date and time and location. But you can change to any date, time and location you want uh, and plan your images in advance. And it also has a nice... Uh, red light mode so you can protect your night vision when you're out in the field um, sort of identifying constellations and stars and there's a couple of op options in the top there star walk 2 is very popular very similar application does the same thing um, and if you're on ios uh, i'd recommend sky guide it's another very very good night sky emulator but it's worth having one of these just so you can familiarize yourself with the night sky and sort of make sense of what you're you're looking at and i have a series on youtube called what's in the night sky so every month at the start of the month i will upload a video talking about what's in the night sky um, for the month ahead so i'll talk about the constellations and planets and moon positions and any special events that happen in that month um, so if you wanted to keep up to date with what's in the night sky for the month ahead, check out the my series on, on YouTube, Witten's What's in the Night Sky. And people share their images with the hashtag Witten's, and I give away prizes every month as well. So it's all great fun. And then there's the, the Milky Way, uh, in particular the Milky Way core, um, which is sort of one of the big... Um, boxes to tick as a beginner and the Milky Way core 
rises in the east, it crosses the southern skies and sets in the west, as I've already talked about um, those constellations in the south. Uh, and if you're not familiar with what the Milky Way is, it's basically a giant spiral galaxy. It's about 100 million light years wide. And our solar system is found halfway along one of the spiraling arms of the galaxy. And during six months of the year, Earth is positioned in such a way that we can see the galactic core, that very bright region in the middle, in the centre. That's the brightest area of the Milky Way in the night sky. So it's typically the most photographed area of the, the Milky Way. Just to give you some idea of Milky Way core season. So it's actually just starting. So now uh, in March and April, the Milky Way core rises in the southeast before sunrise. As we head into the summer months, May, June, July, the Milky Way core is pretty much in the south all night long. And then the end of Milky Way season at August and September, the Milky Way core is found in the southwest after sunset, and then it sets below the horizon as the night goes on. So between March and September, is what's classed as Milky Way core season. So it's just getting started now. Um, in the pre-dawn hours, you'll find the Milky Way core rising in the southeast. And then as the season goes on, it heads south and southwest. And there's, uh, you can also get apps as well to plan your Milky Way shots. One of my favorites being photo pills. Sadly, not the cheapest application. It is, I think it's about 10 pounds or $10. Uh, but something I use quite a lot. And one of the biggest reasons I love it is that you can use maps to plan your Milky Way images. So on the left-hand side there, the the red pin is where I plan to photograph the lighthouse from. And as you can see, the lighthouse is to my south. As I mentioned, the Milky Way core is either in the southeast, the south, or the southwest. So in order to photograph the lighthouse with it, I have to be to the north of the lighthouse looking south. And then you'll also notice lots of round circles around the red pin. You kind of have to imagine those as a big 3D glass dome uh, around my position. And that's where all the stars are. And the white dots on that dome denote the position of the Milky Way. And then the large white dots are the position of the Milky Way core. So standing at that red pin at the date and time at the bottom, 25th of the 7th, 11 p.m. The Milky Way core is going to be in the south, in line with the lighthouse, and then the rest of the Milky Way is going to be stretching over my head to the left. So I, I love this ability to plan uh, uh, using a map. And then what you can do is if you go there in the daytime, you can open up the camera on your smartphone, aim your camera at the lighthouse, and it will show you an augmented reality view of what the Milky Way will look like at that date and at that time. So you can see on the right hand side there, just opened up the camera on the smartphone and it's giving me an augmented reality view of what the Milky Way will look like, where it's gonna be at 11 p.m. on the 25th of July. So you can do some incredible planning in advance and I, I highly recommend you know, exploring the daytime, exploring the landscape at daytime and finding interesting subjects and nice things to photograph because it's impossible to do at night. If you go somewhere at night, you just, you'll struggle to find a good photograph. So I'll always head out in the daytime. I'll find an interesting landscape feature like this stack on the Glamorgan Heritage Coast. Uh, which was facing southeast, so I knew I could come back at the right time of year and photograph it with the Milky Way. And I would never have found this uh, nice stack and this nice scene if I hadn't explored the landscape during the daytime. And it also pays a lot for your safety as well. Uh, a lot of areas, especially the, the mountains and the natural areas and the coastline, um, can be dangerous so it, it's it's really really highly recommended just to scout the area in the daytime make sure everything's fine and safe and you can find yourself some some nice photographs whilst the sun is still up and then just another example with photo pills i found a very beautiful 
composition of South Stack Lighthouse on Anglesey. Uh, the composition was facing west. So I placed the red pin where I wanted to put my camera. And then I found the time and date where the Milky Way would be behind the lighthouse in the west. So you can see those white dots again on that 3D dome. So the Milky Way is stretching from west over my head down to the eastern horizon. And then I went back at that date and that time uh, and got that shot of the Milky Way uh, in line with uh, a South Stack lighthouse. So this beautiful composition with the the steps, the winding staircase, almost inviting the viewer into the image. You kind of feel like you're going on a journey through the image uh, down to the lighthouse, which I put into the center of the frame because it's the, the most prominent um, subject in the image. And of course, the, the light beams nice and symmetric. And then, as you can see, I wanted the flow of the image to continue into the night sky with the Milky Way nicely lined up with the lighthouse. So you can really meticulously plan these things um, in advance, especially you know if you've gone out in the daytime and you found yourself a nice frame, a nice composition, and you can think about what best to include in the night sky at a later date. Um, and of course, my images are edited, as I mentioned already, I shoot in RAW and I edit my images with Lightroom and Photoshop. And unfortunately, we don't have time uh, in this one hour slot to cover the, the editing side of things. But I have a lot of videos on my YouTube channel that you can check out. And I also sell presets for Lightroom that help you edit your images and they come with video tutorials of how to edit your images and how these presets make everything um, a lot easier um, but also allowing you some creative freedom when it comes to editing your images so you can find those over on my website alanwallacephotography.com and just like to thank you all for coming i hope you all learned a lot i see the chat is popping a little bit so i hope we've got some questions Well, Alan, thank you for all your um, hard work on that and some amazing images as well. So, and it's lovely to see so many areas of Wales represented there. Mm -hmm. um, we have got some photo, uh, photos, some questions. Um, if you do have any questions, just a reminder that you can ask in the chat um, or you can raise your hand on your screen. You can even do that with an emoji. If you don't know how to do that, physically raise your hand and I can unmute you. Um, I can't see you all, so I will have to keep scrolling. Uh, so you can have a chance. And if also, Oxy Shara Kamrai, Gassi Shaw Gobin, question man Kamrai, when I try to see Shara Kamrai, Kevid, Melna Chat, Nay, Ishara the Allen. So our first question was from Sean Davis and she's asked, do you use peaking for focusing in the dark? And I'm not sure what peaking is. Um, peaking is, uh, a, f a new feature of digital cameras where um, it highlights the in focus areas with a, a color typically red but you can change it to yellow or white um, I, I've heard of some people using peaking to help them focus in astrophotography I personally not a big fan um, I, I, I'm much, much more comfortable just focusing on the stars themselves and often the peaking can can kind of block your view of the star as you're trying to focus. So I, I typically don't use peaking, um, but I know some people who swear by it. So it's each to their own. Just give it a go yourself. See if you like it, try it without and, and see which one you prefer. Well, thank you, Alan. Um, which settings worked best for you when photographing the bioluminescent plankton from James? Um, the, so the bioluminescent plankton, the settings won't be much more different to what we talked about already. Um, the only bigger difference would be that if you're in a bit more of a light polluted area, uh, I know a lot of people shoot the plankton at Abavan, for example, um, where there's a bit of light pollution, that, that's when you just bring the ISO down. Or if the moon is in the sky at the time, you, you might be able to bring the ISO down. Um, 
I don't see much reason, but you can, if you want, bring the shutter speed down a little bit, and that way the plankton might look a bit more detailed rather than sort of smudges of blue and blurry blue. Um, but otherwise, nothing special. Um, okay, uh, Aled's asked, um, Alan, can we use the slides? Will, will they be available for us to send around? I'm not sure. What did you record? You recorded the session, yeah? We've recorded it, yeah. So this will we will be able to put this on YouTube if that's useful for people. Okay. Uh, if you're if you're happy with it, we can talk about that after. The next uh, question. And then what, just just a private link to all the people who joined, or. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy um, with that. From James, did you use stacking software for the five hours? our star trails what would you recommend this is again like post-production isn't it yeah so the star trail images most of the time i use a free program called sequa no not sequitor sorry star stacks and that's spelt with an x so it's star stacks s-t-a-x um, which you just throw all the images in and it stacks them all for you and then you get these lovely star trail images that come out of it so that just makes things a lot easier Okay, um, and Harad has asked, why didn't the light from South Stack Lighthouse affect the Milky Way clarity? Um, it, having just a sort of singular light source it doesn't really cause much light pollution to the entire sky. If I was if I was further down the steps and the the light was sort of shining directly into my camera, that would have caused a lot of issues but from that position um i'm above the beams and the beams are very concentrated so it's not like the light is spreading out very far the beams are very concentrated and because i'm above the beams um it, it wasn't really coming into my camera and, and ruining the shot but i also use a shutter speed that meant that the light didn't shine in the direction of my camera um, you'll notice all of the beams in that photograph are going out to the side. So I had to time the shot very well so that the, the lights were not pointing in my direction. Thank you very much. I don't think we've got any more questions. There's a lot of thanks on the chats from Ooh. various people. I think everyone's enjoyed very much. If you do have a question, a burning question last minute, do put it in there or raise your hand so I can see. I don't think we have got any so it's speak now or forever hold your peace. <laughs> <laughs> now I think that's, that's it. If you do have any questions, you can always uh, email me and I will try and find an answer. Um, oh, we've had one from Peter. Uh, do you use a star tracker when taking panoramas? Um, yes. I mean, in this discussion today, I've only sort of really talked about single exposure astrophotography but the more you get into it the more you start doing multiple exposure astrophotography where you're taking multiple images and stacking them to get rid of the noise or you're using a star tracker and a star tracker basically allows you to take exposures of the stars for one minute two minutes three minutes sometimes even five minutes uh, because it moves your camera in sync with the stars and then you have to blend that with a foreground because your foreground becomes blurry. So yeah, I, I do I do use a star tracker a lot these days. The only thing that will stop me is either um, wind um, or if I'm hiking somewhere and I'm trying to save weight. Otherwise, I will always try and use a star tracker. Uh, and that way I can take exposures of the night sky of three minutes four minutes and get a much better quality image i use the move shoot move star tracker for most of the time um, and you can get five percent off with code allen on their website i use that most of the time but if i'm doing uh, if i'm using a bigger heavier setup like a telephoto lens and i'm doing sort of deep space astrophotography that's when i'd use the skywatcher star adventurer pro and there's videos on my youtube channel you can even see one there with orion of, of me using a star tracker 
Well, thank you very much, Alan. That's been very informative. Everyone seems to be very happy on the chat. So I think we can uh, close the session. Um, if this is something you'd like to see more of, please do send me an email and I'll see if we can get like a follow-up session um, or something like that arranged. Um, but thank you, Deal Thank you all. Thank you time. ever so much for everybody. Spending an hour with us this, this, this evening. Uh, we've had people from all over the UK, which is really exciting as oh, well. So yeah, we've had people from South Wales, from London, Manchester, um, lots of different places. So um, it's been it's been really good and far reaching. So thanks very much, Alan. And thank you, everyone, for coming.